Good evening, everyone, from Jesus is Lord Ministries International. Uh, we're located here at 3425 Chambersburg Road, about seven miles west of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. And here at Jesus is Lord, we have three services each day. We have service at 10 a.m., 2 p.m., and 6 p.m. And we're so glad that you joined us. You're always welcome. You're welcome to come here, and you're welcome to watch us uh, through technology. Uh, my name's Dave, and tonight I'm. Uh, the title of my message is I Put You in Remembrance. I Put You in Remembrance. The Lord is many, many times putting us in remembrance of what He has told us. His Word truly is our life, is it not? His words are alive and they are true. Uh, but also he puts us in remembrance of what he has done, what he will do, what he has promised. And the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are always reminding us. Jesus' words are, are so valuable to us. As I said, they are our life. Uh, in Jude 5, it tells us that I will therefore put you in remembrance, even though you once knew this. You know, sometimes we forget. Sometimes in the midst of battles and struggles, we, we get knocked down, we get back up, and we dust ourselves off, and we go on with the Lord. Sometimes we just forget what the Lord has said or what He has done. So He says, I will therefore put you in remembrance. Proverbs ten seven tells us that the memory of the just is blessed. We could say the recollection of the righteous is blessed, and we'd be saying the same thing. I'm not trying to add to Scripture, but you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Amen? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Remember in the Hebrew means to mark as to be recognized. To mark as to be recognized. Be mindful means to burn in your mind. And it means to think on these things, which leads to meditation. Think and meditate on the Word of God. In the Greek, remember means to exercise one's memory. It means to recollect or to remember. It means to be mindful. And it means to rehearse. That means to go over it and to testify to one another, to tell one another. You know, we overcome our enemy, by, how do we do that? By the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Glory to God. The Lord told us in John chapter 15, verse 20, remember the word that I told you. Jesus said, remember the word that I told you. There are many, many phrases throughout the scriptures that, that talk about our memory and our remembrance, you know, like I said, I put you in remembrance, or I remind you, I bring to your remembrance. Remember when? Uh, another one would be, therefore, watch and remember. Remember the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. And recently, the Lord reminded me to remind you of an extremely important principle that each of us should obey so that we were always moving forward in our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and with the purpose that God had for us before the foundation of the world. If you will, turn with me to Philippians chapter 3. And here we see and we hear Paul's testimony, and we're going to look at part of his testimony tonight. Before we begin, let us bow our hearts before the Lord. Father God, we come to you in the precious name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for this time. We thank you for this opportunity, Father, that we can come together, that we can learn of you, we can learn of your word, and learn of your ways, Father God, that you can bring us to remembrance of all those wonderful things that you've done for us, Father, and the wonderful things that you've said. Your words truly are our life. Holy Spirit, please come and please Lead us and guide us and teach us as only you can do. Orchestrate our time together tonight, Holy Spirit, and testify of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Philippians chapter 3, and we're going to read verses 12 to 14. Philippians 3. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I press toward the goal of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. The phrase I want to zero in on tonight is found in verse 13. Forgetting those things which are behind. Forgetting those things which are behind. Forgetting there means to lose out of mind. You lose it. It's not in your mind anymore. It also means to neglect. Neglect those things. It means that you're not aware of those things anymore. Those disappointments, those failures, those hurts, and those pains which hold you back. You hold on to them, and they hold you back. It's time to move on. It's time to move on, brothers and sisters. Another meaning of forgetting there is to be ignorant of. To be ignorant. The word ignorant in the Greek is the word agnoio, and it has two meanings. One of the meanings is that someone has come to the knowledge of the truth, but they have decided not to walk in that knowledge of truth. And the other meaning is simply, you just don't know. You just don't know about a certain subject, a certain, a certain thing, a certain person, whatever it is. You just don't know. And that's what it means here, forgetting those things. You don't know it anymore because you, for, you have forgotten it. It is time to move on. It is time to forget the past. We must not allow the past to block our future. We must not allow the past to block our future. The past is behind you. You must move on from those disappointments, those failures, those hurts, and those pains. And you say, well, that seems hard. I understand that. It certainly does. And you're, you're tempted many, many times to relive the situation. But you know what? There's nothing you can do about it now. There's nothing you can do about that situation. We must learn the lesson from that situation, and we must move on. Paul said he had not yet achieved what God wanted him to achieve, but there's one thing he does. He focuses on forgetting the past and looking forward to what is ahead. You know, you almost died. But you didn't. You didn't die. You need to move on. Whatever that thing is, it almost destroyed you. But it didn't. You are still here. They meant to harm you. And they did harm you. It's like getting punched right in the nose with a fist. It really hurt. It knocked you down. It knocked you flat. And they really did hurt you. But listen, God kept you. Father God kept you. You need to move on. You need to move on. You know, I'm reminded of a lady that I worked with for, I don't know, probably seven or eight years, and she went to be with the Lord in her 60s. But, and she was a good woman. She was a, a good godly woman. She was a single parent. She raised four children on her own. She worked, and uh, she was a hard worker and a, and a, and a real good person. But she had a problem, and it would always come up in conversation, no matter when or where we were. And she would, she would always uh, had this problem with forgiveness. She said, well, you just don't know what they did to me. They just hurt me so badly. And I understand that. And many of us have been in that situation. And, you know, I don't really know if she ever forgave 
those people or not. She was in a singing group when she was uh, probably 20 years old, and uh, it was a, it was a uh, a church group, a, a singing group, and the pastor and his wife uh, relieved her from her duties. They they put her out of the group for whatever reason. She never said that never that never came up, but she just held on to that and held on to that and. It, it just blocked her future for so long. It held her back. And like I say, I don't know if she ever forgot him or not, but I was reminded of, of, the, of these two scriptures. You know, the, the word says that everything should be established by two or three witnesses. And the first one I want to read is in Matthew 6, uh, verse 14. For if you forgive men their trespasses... Your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. He's not able to forgive your trespasses if you don't forgive others. And the second witness is in Mark chapter 11, verses 25 and 26. And when you stand praying, forgive. If you have ought against any, that your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. My friends, my brothers, my sisters, we know that God is not a respecter of persons. That applies to you. It applies to me. If we do not forgive, our Heavenly Father cannot forgive us. You know, I, I have a friend, I had another friend, a pastor friend. It's not in this area, but he used to share how he had such a hard time forgiving people. You know, someone would say something, they would hurt his wife or hurt him or you know, say something about something they didn't like in the church or whatever. And, and some of them ended up leaving the church. And he just struggled with that so bad that he would share with me that, I just can't forgive. I just, I just can't. And I would always encourage him. I would always tell him these two scriptures. Brother, if you don't forgive, you're a pastor. And if you don't forgive, God cannot forgive you. It's a serious, serious thing. My friends, we cannot let yesterday's pain destroy today's blessing. I said we cannot let yesterday's pain destroy today's blessing. You, my friend, my brother, my sister, you still have a prize in front of you. Whatever that thing was, whatever hurt, whatever disappointment, whatever that was, forget it and move on. You need to keep going forward. Tomorrow will be better if you can just move on. That prize that Paul talks about there in verse 14, that prize is still ahead of you, glory to God. But you know, to reach that prize, for you and me to reach that prize, it's going to take perseverance. It's going to take persistence. They mean the same thing. Perseverance is the pathway to a victorious life. We must per persevere. We must be persistent. It means to be earnest towards something. It means to be constantly diligent. It means to adhere to, to a cause closely. It means to attend to this continually. It means you're tenacious. You're like a bulldog. You know how a bulldog is? They're tenacious. They're always growling and they're always fighting. It means that you're going to stick to it. You're going to stick to it in spite of any and all opposition. Perseverance is a pathway that we must take. You know, soldiers, for example, know that is true. What is the simplest goal of a soldier? Any soldier in any army. His simplest goal and his first goal is to still be standing when the battle's over. And you and I will definitely be standing when the battle's over if we keep on the full armor of God. We talked about that last week. We need to put on every piece of that armor. And that armor is defensive, and it's also offensive. We need to stab 
the enemy with the word, with the sword of the spirit, the word of God, glory to God. Hallelujah. You know, and those, those shoes, they were, they were killer shoes. They weren't comfortable shoes. They were killer boots that the, that the Roman soldiers wore. They had prongs on them like that. They were vicious weapons. And they stomped and they stomped and they stomped. And if you keep stomping with your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel, your enemy problem, your devil problem will be gone. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Be standing after the battle. You know, Paul wasn't a perfect man. But he sure did follow the perfect man. Paul is trying to be more like the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul knew he was like everybody else. He was marred by sin and he was lost for eternity if it wasn't for the grace of God. Paul's victorious living was due to his perseverance. It was, done, it was due to his persistence. Forgetting what is behind so very important my friend if you cannot forget your mistakes you will have a very tough time with perseverance you will have a very tough time with persistence think about paul think about paul when he was saul you know he he persecuted christians he had a part in stephen's death Christians suffered great pain because of Paul's work. Excuse me, because of Saul's work. But after he met Jesus, after he was born again on the road to Damascus, he must have seen their faces. He must have heard their agonizing cries. He must have grieved for what he had done before he had met the Lord Jesus. Anyone who perseveres must, must move past his or her mistakes. You must move past your mistakes. I must move past my mistakes. You need to forget the pain of past embarrassment and move on with God's purpose in your life. Just like Paul, you and I must come face to face with the grace of God. We must accept that grace and we must run our race just like an, uh, an Olympic marathon or aiming for the finish line. 26.2 miles. That's a long race, my friend. With a strong, steady pace. We used to sing that song. Running the race with a strong, steady pace. But without persistence, without perseverance, we will never know that victory. Without following the Lord daily, every day of our lives, victory is impossible but with perseverance, with patience, our victory is certain. Glory to God. We must, we must keep running for that prize. I mean, let's face it, we have all failed in the past. We have all fallen short of the goal for God in our lives. You know, we're dissatisfied right now with our certain or with our spiritual conditioning. We want to be more like Jesus, don't we? We want to be more Christ-like. That's what Paul is talking about here. You know, if someone thinks they've arrived spiritually, they cease to grow in the Lord. But when you're willing to admit that, you, that there are areas that you need to grow, that is a sign that you are growing. You are a growing Christian. Even the Apostle Paul had areas in his life that needed work. I hope that does something for you. I know what that, that means a lot to me. That encourages me that even Paul had areas that needed worked on. Look how Paul examined himself with me. First of all, in verse 12, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect. And then in verse 13, he says, Brethren, I count not myself, to have apprehended. I count not myself to have apprehended for what I was apprehended for. I mean, think about it. This is the Apostle Paul. He had a lot to brag about. He had a lot to boast about, but he didn't boast in himself. He boasted 
and the Lord Jesus Christ. But he, would, he did have a lot he could brag about. He was chosen to be the apostle to the Gentiles. God used him to write over two-thirds of the New Testament. He was a tremendous soul winner for God, and he preached the Word of God. Hallelujah. You know, it looked like Paul was making the grade for the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we look at his life, it'd be easy to conclude that Paul had arrived. But Paul knew the truth. He knew he had not arrived. He was still working toward that ultimate goal of his faith, which is the ultimate goal of our faith, Christ-likeness, being more like the Lord Jesus Christ each and every day. Paul's response to his own life was a mark of his spiritual maturity. You know, he told us that we must beware of those who think they have arrived. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, Paul said this, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. And then he said in Galatians 6, verse 3, For if a man think himself to be something, For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. My friends, you and I have not reached perfection, but we will someday. We will someday when we see the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. You know, the Apostle Paul realized he wasn't perfect, but he was not content to let that cause him to sit still for the Lord. You know, it's a shame, but too many people get discouraged with their lives and then they quit on God. My friend, it's not a matter of if you will fail. It's a matter of when you will fail. It's not a matter if I will fail. It's a matter of when I will fail. We cannot let our fears cause us to drop out of the race for the Lord. What do we do when we fall? We get back up. We dust ourselves off and we start to run again. My friend, I want you to know and I want you to believe it is never, never too late for a new beginning. As long as you have breath, as long as you're on this planet, as long as you're one of the 8 billion, 45 million plus souls on this planet, it's never too late for a new beginning. Glory to God. Thank you, Father. Look what Paul says here, starting in verse 12. But I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. And then in verse 13, he said, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are ahead. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Paul uses all action verbs here, action terms. He's using very descriptive language to describe the race that he is running. I want to share with you some great statements that Paul made. First of all, in verse 12, but I follow after. The Apostle Paul says, but I follow. Literally, literally in the Greek, that means to run swiftly in order to catch a person or a thing. Many times it referred to a hunter, to a hunter pursuing his prey. We've all, we've always known, all have known deer hunters who pursue, pursue that buck in the wintertime. You have to have that buck. They pursue him at all costs. But it also has the idea of chasing, chasing the finish line to, to reach that goal. Whatever that goal is, it is a picture of pursuing, a picture of pursuit. And for Paul, it was the hope of apprehending something, to lay a hold of something. Paul was saying, I am pursuing the goal of laying hold hold of all that Jesus laid hold of me for, apprehending what I was apprehended for. 
The Apostle Paul realized that he was saved for a purpose. God had a plan for Paul's life. And my friend, God has a plan for your life too. God definitely has a plan for you. He didn't let you out. He didn't not consider you. And I want to tell you, that plan that God has for you, only you can fulfill that particular plan. He knew you before he formed you in your mother's belly. He said, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's belly, and I had a plan and a purpose and a destiny for you before you came out of your mother's womb, glory to God, before the foundation of the world. And we need to be like Paul. He was not satisfied until he had apprehended that for which he had been apprehended. You know, we each need to answer the question, what am I doing about what God saved me for? What am I doing about what God saved me for? Unfortunately, some people are just stuck on salvation. And what I mean by that is they got saved, but that's as far as they've gone for the Lord. God saved you for a purpose. God saved every one of us for a purpose. If you don't know what that purpose is, get at Jesus' feet and ask him. He said, you have not because you ask not. Ask him and I'll guarantee you he will surely show you what your purpose is. And then when you know that purpose, pursue it with all your heart. Be like Paul. Let nothing satisfy you but satisfying the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. In verse 13, the apostle said, This one thing I do. But this one thing I do. Paul is like that Olympic champion that we talked about earlier that Olympic marathoner. He specializes in something. That's what an Olympic marathoner does. That's what Paul's doing here. He specialized in one thing, reaching that goal he talked about there in verse 14. Paul left behind the past, and he reached for the future. Someone excels when he or she specializes. Someone excels when he or she specializes. The Apostle Paul had a one-track mind. And my friends, that's the main reason he was successful. To him, nothing, absolutely nothing, was more important than pleasing the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe that's one of the problems with today's Christians. Many of us cannot say, this one thing I do. Can you say this one thing I do? Most of us are pulled in a thousand different directions at the same time. Let me ask you this. Did you ever pray for someone who cannot stop talking about the problems, the cares of this life, and all the things that's going on in their life? Did you ever pray for someone like that? And you just want to Hug them. You just want to grab them and say, be still. Just be still. You need to quiet your soul. You need to quiet your soul. Psalm 46.10 says what? Be still and know that I am God. <laughs> be still and know that I am God. The number one way he still speaks to you and he still speaks to me is that still, small voice. If I don't quiet my soul, if I don't quiet my mind, my will, and my emotions, I have no chance. I cannot hear that still, small voice of God. You know, when, when our life's over, there's only one thing that's going to matter. How well did you run? How well did I run for the Lord our God? You know, we need to have a one-track mind like Paul when it comes to living our life. We really do. That is the only thing that we really should be living for. Running the race that God has set before us.
Again, verse 13, Paul said, forgetting those things. Paul is saying, I refuse. I absolutely refuse to look behind me at my past. Forgetting means he, he ceases to be affected by his past. You and I must do that. We must cease to be affected by our past. You know, if we run our race on past successes, we will have a tendency to lay back and rest on our accomplishments. And then on the other hand, if we run with our eye on our past failures, we will lay back for fear of failing again. Not, good, not a good situation. And another thing I want to mention right now is that as you are running this race, as you are running your race for the Lord, stop looking at how other people are doing in the race. <laughs> it's so important, my friend. You know what? It doesn't matter who you are. Someone is always going to outrace you. Someone's always going to outrace me. And someone's always going to run behind, and some are even going to drop out of the race. But we can't be concerned about others. And for goodness sake, we cannot worry about what others are doing. Our duty is to run to please the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? That's our duty, to run to please Him. And when we do run, the Lord Jesus should be the sole focus of our attention. I want to read two familiar scriptures to you. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, Wherefore, therefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, and the sin, and the sin which so easily besets us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Glory, glory, glory. Thank you, Lord Jesus. The joy of the Lord truly is our strength. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just picture with me for a moment that, that marathon runner, 26.2 miles. I can't imagine running 26.2 miles. Can you? But what dedication, what, what straining it takes but that runner is near the finish line and he leans forward and he strains for his goal. And that's what Paul's telling us here. He's saying, I'm reaching out with all that I have to be sure that I win my race. Can you honestly say that you're striving to reach the goal? Can I honestly say that I'm striving to reach the goal? You know, unfortunately, for, for some believers, the Christian life is a hit-or-miss proposition. We just kind of take it as it comes. If we succeed for the Lord, we say, oh, praise the Lord, glory to God, praise His name. If we stumble and fall, we say, oh, well, I'll just try to do better tomorrow. But that wasn't Paul, and that's not what Paul is saying here. He was not content to sit around and wait for his life to happen. Paul was busy making his life happen. He was out there reaching for everything he could to become more like the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we need to do, my brothers, my sisters. He was Paul was trying to reach the full potential for the glory of God. What a lesson. What a wonderful lesson for us. I press toward the mark for the prize. Verse 14. I press toward the mark. The mark is the goal that Paul has in view. The mark is the goal that you have in your view. You know, Paul was oblivious to his, to his surroundings. 
He was just headed for that goal that he's talking about there in verse 14. He wanted to finish his race well. And when he did reach the end of his life, he was able to leave the testimony that he had indeed run well. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, he said, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Glory to God. Glory to God. Thank you, Father. There's a great need for us to avoid the trap, the trap of becoming distracted by the events in this life. There is a mark. There is a goal that we should be striving for. Father, help us to keep our eyes on the goal. You know, too many people are referring again to that to the runner. They, they, they're primed and they're ready to come out to that race. But after a few months or a few short years, they quit. They become distracted. And then they fall out of the race. You and I need to be steady, my friend. We, not, we need not to live for the moment, but we must run with eternity in our view at all times. Our Father is honored by a well-run race and a life well-lived. We cannot afford to be distracted, and we must run with our eyes on the goal. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Paul saying, I'm running for the prize. I'm running for that award that the victor of the race receives. Paul wanted to run a good race. And he wanted to win that prize that God had for him. Paul absolutely knew that God called him for a reason. He called him to carry out his duty before the Lord. He has called you to do the very same thing. Paul knew that successful completion of his goal would allow him to enjoy the rewards of the Lord Jesus. And by the way, my friends, things are still the same. Jesus saved you. He saved you, my friend, to do a job for him and for his kingdom. When we do what the Lord wants and we live in pursuit of the prize, we too will receive the rewards that come with faithful service to the Lord. 1 Corinthians 3, 8 says, Now he who plants and he who waters is one. Each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. And Matthew 25, 21 says, His Lord said to him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of of your Lord. Glory to God. Paul got what he was after. Paul got what he was after. In 2 Timothy 4, verse 8. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness with the Lord, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. <laughs> Glory to God. Not unto me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. We will get that, my friend. My brother, my sister, we will get that. But only if we run for the prize. The prize, the high calling. Jesus saved us that we might follow after him and to strive to be like him in every detail of our lives. We must treat our relationship with the Lord like the precious thing that it is, that it is by striving to live up to what Paul called the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Verse 15 and 16. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. Paul saying, therefore, as many as us that are mature, 
be thus minded. And if in anything you be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. The apostle here is saying that this is the mature Christian attitude. And then he warns us in verse 16. If we have a different opinion how we should run this Christian race, then the Lord will deal with us on this matter. If we are to succeed in the Christian life and honor God by the life that we live, then we're going to have to run the race the way he says. We're going to have to run the race the way he tells us. We must run with our eyes upon the Lord Jesus Christ. If we will attain the prize of Christ's likeness, we have to pay the price. We have to pay the price of struggle. We have to pay the price of dedication. We can't allow compromise and we can't allow worldly distractions. And yes, it will be a hard fought victory. But in the end, my friend, when we see Jesus' face, oh, when we see his face, it'll all be worth it. It'll all be worth it. How well are you running today, my friend? How well are you running today? Are your eyes on the Lord Jesus alone? Getting your focus solely on him will give you direction you need to successfully run that race for his glory and your eternal benefits as you run for the prize. Turn and keep your eyes upon Jesus. As you forget those things which are behind and reach forth unto those things which are before. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for this time. We thank you for this message. Father, we thank you for putting us in remembrance, Father God, of all the things you have said. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from your mouth, Father. That's present tense. That's right now. You are speaking to us right now, Father God, and we thank you for that. We thank you, Father God, that this day we are loaded Loaded once again this day with your benefits, Father God. We are eternally grateful for that, Father. And Father, we are thankful that your word will not return unto you void. Father, we thank you for these things in the name that's above every name. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>